I'm Rick Suckman with the UNC Jordan Institute for Families and welcome to the webinar Creating Normalcy for Young People in Foster Care. If you haven't already done so, there's a link there on the page for the webinar handouts. So it would certainly be very helpful for you to uh, have during the presentation. Let's take a look at our agenda for this evening. I'm going to start off by orienting you to the webinar room and then we will allow our presenters to introduce themselves. We'll spend the remainder of our next 60 minutes together talking about the definition of normalcy, what the law says about normalcy, what normalcy means to you, whether you're a foster parent, youth in care, or agency service provider. And we also certainly want to make some time to answer all your questions. Many of you are participating today in groups or participating with a family member or your social worker, which makes interaction just a little more challenging, but we want to afford the opportunity for you to participate, and I see many of you have already found that chat box. That is the method in, in which you can send us questions or comments. We'll certainly try the best we can to answer them during the event, but sometimes we'll just have to capture them and see if we can't get to them at the end of the presentation. Okay, you will also see at the top of your toolbar there a little guy with his hand raised, an icon there. If you click on the drop down for that, you will see that you can tell us to, for example, speak louder, speak softer, speed up. If you could, those of you participating in a group this evening, please practice by clicking on that icon with the guy with his hand raised and select raise hand to let us know that you're out there. I'm seeing lots of folks clicking. Great. Okay. Again, I just wanted to welcome each of you to today's webinar. I'm Rick Seckman. I am filling in for Laura Phipps with the Jordan Institute for Families. This webinar is being recorded for those of who were unable to attend or those that would like to review it later. We have technical assistance support from Philip Armfield and John McMahon with UNC. Our panelists, I am going to allow each of them actually to introduce themselves, so we'll start with Marcella, if you could give a little brief introduction. So funny. Thanks, Rick. Hi, everybody. It's Marcella Middleton. Um, I know a few of you out there, and some of you I don't, but I'm excited for you all to be on um, tonight. I work with Say So as the youth trainer, and um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Say So, it stands for Strong Able Youth Speaking Out. Um, it's a youth-led advocacy board um, comprised of youth who have been in foster care. Um, basically, what they do is go around the state of North Carolina and advocate for themselves as well as other youth who are in the foster care system. Um, I was a part of Say So and have been since I was. 15 years old. Um, I absolutely love Say So. And for all the people out there, hey, shout out to y'all. I love y'all. Welcome, Marcella. And Wanda, can you give us a brief introduction? Okay, it's going to come on. Good evening, everyone. My name is Wanda Douglas. I am a former foster parent and an adoptive parent of three. I am a trainer and a family partner coordinator with North Carolina Families United, which is a state family agency. And I am a part of the North Carolina System of Care Expansion Project. And I am so excited about being here with you tonight. Welcome, Wanda. And Tony, can you give us a brief introduction? My name is Tony Douglas, and I've been a therapeutic foster parent for 17 years. We've had over 100 children in our home, and I've been, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been directly involved in the adoption of four of those children. I've trained agency leaders, 
business owners and foster parents on the topic of helping youth reach self-sufficiency for over 12 years. I'm honored that you have taken the time out of your busy schedule for me to express my excitement about the Normancy Act. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tony. And last but not least, let us welcome Erin. Hi, my name is Erin Connor. I am the Interim Links Coordinator for the State of North Carolina, and I'm also very excited to be here tonight. Great. Thank you to all those helping us with the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we'll give you the presenter's contact information if you wanted to say thank you or have an additional question for them. Okay, here are discussion questions for the evening. Throughout the webinar, we want you to be thinking about some of these questions. We hope you'll have further discussion with when it's over. We will continue to reference these questions throughout the webinar. They are, what is normalcy to me? What would I do differently? What do I need to do to have normal opportunities? And how can I make it happen? You also, of course, have this in one of your handouts that you could be using with your group, your social worker, a parent guardian right now after the webinar. So now I am going to pass it to Marcella, who is going to get us started by addressing why normalcy is so important and what it means to your day-to-day -day life. Thank you, Rick. So as you guys can see, um, normalcy, is, is, normalcy is the opportunity to participate in simple, commonplace activities such as going to a friend's house, taking a school's trip, working on a job after school, joining a club, dating, attending the prom, and learning to drive. And there's many other things um, that are involved in normalcy, and the ramifications of those, we'll be talking about those throughout um, the webinar. But what this means, like, specifically, um, for you guys as young people is that you guys can be involved in quote unquote normal activities, age appropriate things um, like the things that are mentioned here on um, the screen here such as taking school trips, spending the night at your friends, getting your driver's license um, and those are things that are important um, to your development I think because we all need to be involved in those things. I know when I was in the foster care system I didn't necessarily have the opportunity to um, be involved in all of these things um, or just have the, rem the room to be involved in those things but now you all have the opportunity to be involved in these things. So why did the law change? So for years, young people in foster care have been prevented from participating in everyday activities essential for their development and successful transition to adulthood. Um, basically, like I said before, this Normalcy Act is important to your development because it allows you as young people to be involved in age-appropriate things that support you in transitioning out of the foster care system, um, just giving you basically the responsibility um, that it that at the age level in which you're at now. Um, and it says because of real and perceived legal and policy constraints, many have been denied the chance to participate in normal activities. Recent federal and state laws have been passed to address this problem. So let me give you an example. When I was in the foster care system, um, both my sister and I um, were asked by one of my friend's mom if we wanted to go to Disney World. And um, we ended up not being able to go because my my um, mom still had that legal, the legal guardianship over me or custody. She just still had her, her parental rights over my sister and I. So um, we had to end up going through all these different layers before they asked my mom. So going through my social worker, the supervisor, and them having a meeting about it and everything like that, and my foster parent, and they ended up saying no because they had to go through those different, la those different layers. But now the, the Normalcy Act cuts out those different layers of um, of permission and now based on the Normalcy Act you're able to really work with your foster parent to say okay you know can I go here and based on the relationship with you that you have with them or based on your behaviors and different things like that just you know if, if if they feel like it's a it's a positive thing or if you know you've worked hard to 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 be able to be involved in what activity whatever activity you want to be in then your foster parent has the right to say yeah you know you've been doing great with your grades yes you can go
So myself, along with a couple other um, alumni of the Foster Youth, had the opportunity to be at the signing with Governor Pat McCoy, um, the signing of the Normalcy Act, um, which was really monumental, again, because I, when I was in foster care, I, I wasn't awarded these opportunities. And now, because of the Normalcy Act, you all will be able to um, be involved in, like I said, age-appropriate things, such as getting your driver's license, spending the night with your friends, going to prom, being involved in ROTC, um, and a whole other plethora of, of age-appropriate activities. Okay, so some of the normal activities that we have, um, just activities that all youth enjoy, um, school sports, clubs, and events opportunities with your friends, and opportunities to be yourself, um, opportunities to explore interests, interests and career potentials. And I think this is really, really important because I did not have the opportunity to really explore myself until I got to college. And again, and I'm going to say it so many times tonight, but you guys have the opportunity now based on this Normalcy Act to do that, to be involved in opportunities where you're finding yourself and you're hanging out with your friends and you're doing things that are normal. And I think what's important to, to really highlight is that um, it's not most young people that get in foster care um, are not in foster care because of any fault of their own. Um, and so they shouldn't be denied to, um, access to these, these um, age appropriate things, um, clubs, sports, events, be, hanging out with your friends because you're in foster care. And this Normalcy Act allows you to be involved in these normal activities. Isn't that wonderful? All right, so now you're now um, I want to talk a little bit about normal activities um, that you can be in and that make a difference. So typical development, um, and that's just like I said, if you're in sports, you have the opportunity to be around other young people and be socialized and just kind of be in that realm, you know, where you are developmentally, um, you know, talking with your friends, um, you know, making jokes, just being normal, just being a regular young person. Also, school performance. Um, if you're involved in different activities um, in your school, you know, maybe the debate team, maybe ROTC, uh, maybe different clubs like the Key Club or, um, you know, the Boys and Girls Club, that will help you um, with your school performance because it's not like you're just closed off into this small, you know, yeah, it's just about school, just about school, but you also have other activities where you can be involved. Um, and then healthy and positive relationships. If you're not around people and you don't get to interact with them and, and be your normal self, um, it's really going to be hard to make those healthy, positive relationships. And again, this Normalcy Act really pushes for that. We want you all to, to be involved in different activities so that you can produce healthy and positive relationships. Your identity. Your identity is important because in this, when, when you go out and there and you and you're involved in these different clubs and you know just being around different people you learn about yourself you learn so much more about yourself because you're out there in a world where you're where you have to challenge yourself and do certain things that you may not have been able to do before like for me um, when I was at home I didn't get to participate in sports and stuff like that because um, I was just moving a lot. I was doing a lot of moving. And so, like I said, I didn't really get a chance to I, to really identify Marcella until I went to college. And now you guys have the opportunity at a much earlier stage. Um, and then resiliency, it really pushes for that because it shows that even though, though you guys went through so much um, and you may be going through so much, you get a break when you go to sports or you may go to different activities with clubs or you go to weekend retreats and maybe spend time with your friends. Um, you have the opportunity to really fill out your resiliency because even though you went through all this stuff, you can still be a part of things and do it to the best of your ability. Thank you so much, Marcella, for sharing your experience with us and helping us understand how important normalcy is for youth. Now we're going to have Aaron talk with us about what the law says regarding normalcy so you can understand how to apply the law to your own life. Aaron? Good evening, everybody. I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, oh, there we go. Um, this law, so the one of the main pieces of legislation that impacted young people in terms of their access to these normal activities was the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act. And this was a federal law um, that was passed 
um, in 2014. Um, and then we had to implement the standard by um, last September. And so um, the standard has been implemented. We've got some documents that have been published, and they're part of um, your attachments um, for foster parents to learn about implementing um, the standard. Um, it made several other changes to child welfare agencies and that impact the um, young people in foster care. And this was one of the driving forces behind North Carolina's Family Foster Care Act that Marcella mentioned previously. Um, at the state level to really implement this standard. Um, and I'll go to the first slide. So the North Carolina Foster Care Family Act was signed into law last July. Um, and the provisions were mostly effective October 1st. Um, the key sponsor was uh, Senator uh, Tamara Berenger of Wake County. The, this slide has the link to the full text of the law if you're interested. Um, but this is the law that created the normalcy provisions that we're going to talk about today. Um, and it included those important pieces of the federal legislation that I discussed a moment ago. Um, this law also removed barriers to young people um, acquiring driver's licenses and um, their ability to get um, automobile insurance. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So really what the reasonable and prudent parent standard is, is a way for foster parents to um, pro make decisions on um, for young people in terms of their involvement in uh, different activities without necessarily having to go to the agency or the courts to get approval before the young person can participate. So Marcella gave some great examples of what these activities include. Um, I've kind of repeated a little bit on this slide extracurricular enrichment activities, cultural activities, those types of things. Um, they're intended, the standard is intended to maintain the, your health and safety, but also encourage your growth and to make sure that you have those opportunities to develop um, yourself mentally, physically, emotionally, that you can explore what you're interested in um, for career or education, long term, all of those good things. Um, it's the way that foster parents can make decisions um, in a sensible way. They're parental type decisions, similar to how they might make decisions for their own children to participate in activities. So if you, if their own children wanted to go um, spend the night at a friend's house, or if you wanted to go spend the night at a friend's house, they would want to know things like um, who, who that friend is, who are their parents, where, um, where do they live, um, what kinds of things you're going to be doing, when you're going to be back. Um, all of that kind of information, just related to things that, to make sure that you're safe and that you have access to, to those kinds of social activities. Um, the, so this standard applies to family foster care, therapeutic foster care, as well as youth caring institutions. Those, say, for example, a group home. Every type of agency like that has to have a designated person on their staff that can apply the standard, so that can help um, you in making those decisions and in engaging in these activities. Um, so you, there might be circumstances where the court would order that you wouldn't be able to participate in something, but that would depend on, on the case and on the activity. And that's also based on what um, is safe for you. Um, so caregivers and foster parents have the authority to give or withhold permission without the prior approval, like I said before, of the court or the agency for certain activities. Um, so whether you can participate, is, it's not automatic. You're not automatically going to be given permission just because you want to participate in something. If you're not given per permission to participate, it could be because maybe there's safety concerns, um, there's some issues um, of, of behavior, either either your, your own um, or whoever that you're wanting to hang out with, or as Marcella said earlier, maybe, maybe you don't have your grades up, so maybe you need to do some studying before you can go out um, and, and, and do some social things. And also there might be a period of time where your first place with a, your foster parents where they have to get to know you, they have to get to know your personality, um, they have to get to know the kinds of things that um, that you like to do, they have to know that they that they can trust you, that you're going to be safe um, in making those good decisions. For resource parents, um, 
when applying the reasonable and prudent parent standard, you're not liable if you're acting in accordance with the standard. Um, you would be liable if you are negligent or you don't follow the standard in applying um, the, those decisions that you make. Um, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about driving. I know that this is kind of a big topic that you're all probably interested in. Um, so as of February 29th of this year, um, 28, about 28, 29% of young people in foster care were 13 and older. So most of these young people were between the age of 13 and 17. In other words, most of the young people of that age are either um, taking driver's ed or um, obtaining a license permit or old enough to start making plans. So your 13, your 13 year olds are going to start thinking about that. Your 13 and 14 year olds are going to start thinking about when they can take that and how do they get permission and that kinds of thing. Um, and, then, and then your your 14, 15s and above are, are also going to be um, either taking driver's ed or at the age where they can take driver's ed or obtain a permit or a driver's license. So a big part of the Foster Care Family Act was reducing these barriers to getting your driver's license or permit. So now young people in foster care, can, 16 and older, can actually purchase their own insurance. Um, and they're responsible for paying the, the bills, and they're responsible for damages if there's an accident where they're at fault. The law also looked at who can sign um, when you go to apply for your driver's license or your permit. Um, so that would be your guardian ad litem, um, the DSS director, or somebody that they designate. Um, and if not either of those two, then the court that has jurisdiction can, can approve that. Thank you, Erin. We did have a couple questions that came in while you're presenting, if I can ask them of a really quick Aaron before we go on to our next presenters. One of them was, are there limitations to youth having an overnight weekend trip? So sure, there might be. Again, as I said before, it might be a um, the the trip or the person that the they want to to go see or or go on an overnight trip with um, maybe there's a safety issue there um, the one of your handouts actually might be useful in helping to make some of these decisions it's the reasonable and prudent parenting activities guide and it breaks down examples of activities from family recreation um, social extracurricular activities um, all of those kinds of things into the types of activities that caregivers can um, approve independently without having to consult an agency um, or the courts, and the types of things that um, activities that they would need to talk with a child welfare agency or the court about. So any events that are activities that are lasting longer than 72 hours automatically fall into that category that requires approval beforehand. So say you've got a, um, a family trip that's going to be longer than 72 hours or a, a class trip, because I know sometimes classes go on, on overnight trips that's so going to be longer than 72 hours. You would need to ask um, for permission of the agency or the court before that could be approved. So that's one example. Thank you. And one other question related that I'll get to. It says, what about foster family taking foster children for a weekend trip out of the state? See if I, uh, that's something that I'll have to provide more detail about later. Um, to be on the safe side, it's probably something that needs to be discussed with the agency before that can be approved. Don't, I don't think that's specifically mentioned in the um, activities guide. And finally, one other reference to that reasonable prudent parent guide. Um, there is a question regarding well, in the guide, of, there's a reference saying that there's a recommendation of a minimum age of 14 to babysit. Does it matter if the children that they will be babysitting may be very little? 
Does that make a difference in the age minimum age requirement of the babysitter being 14? I don't know that we have talked about that as such. I think part of the recommendation would be that the young person who's babysitting um, be trained um, so that they there's all kinds of um, opportunities. I, often I think they're through the Red Cross or at hospitals to take babysitting courses. And those courses generally cover um, all kinds of things, first aid and, and CPR, and even can cover those types of things related to younger children and, and an infant. So that might be a little bit of a discretion thing. And, and it may even be something that you would want to talk about with the agency if there is concern that the young person may not, um, yeah, may not be that mature enough to, to care for very young children. Um, but if you feel like they're, they're mature enough, they've had this training, it's appropriate for them to take care of the younger children, um, that might be something that they can do. But as far as like a hard and fast rule, I don't think we made any specific rules like that there was an age cutoff for the 14-year-old. Great. Thank you very much, Erin. I'm going to try and move us along a little bit to our next presenter. And we're certainly continuing to keep capturing your questions and hope that we have some more time at the end of the presentation to answer as many as we can. Now Wanda, excuse me, now Tony is going to address what foster parents need to know. What foster parents need to know, as caregivers and resource parents, we have permission to parent the children in care the same way that we parent our own biological children. You got to know that this is what they have been asking for for so long. They just wanted to be treated equally. And as good parents, we make prudent decisions by just keeping the bigger picture in mind. We're always looking at what is in the best interest of the child. And what are the health and the safety issues or the safety factors that are at hand? As parents, we know that it's impossible actually to, to raise children without a risk. We know that. But this is why we don't automatically say no simply just to manage the risk. What we attempt to do basically is to leverage that risk and as much as possible just to keep our children safe. As a resource parent, we have a tremendous amount of freedom to say yes to the children and youth in care be simply because of the Normancy Act. And as long as we are acting in accordance with the reasonable and prudent parent standards, the fear factor of being liable decreases tremendously. As a foster parent or a foster caregiver, you need to be confident in your ability to parent these children in care. And here's the reason why. You have a lot of training and also the training that's actually available to you. You're constantly in communication with people that are involved in the youth life. You participate in shared parenting, CFTs, and court hearings. And because you're always there to assist and support the emotional and the development growth of our youth in care. As a foster caregiver, we're going to be asking all of the youth in care to be patient with us. In order for us to parent you as our own biological children, we're going to be asking you a lot of questions in order to get the sufficient information to make the right decisions. We're going to be asking you the where, the who, and the when. So in other words, where you're going, who you're going with, Who's going to be there? When does it start and end? When do I expect you home? Who's bringing you home? And as foster caregivers, we, we're going to be asking ourselves several questions as well. And in some cases, we have to think about a deeper level 
to give back to ourselves that good and honest answer as it pertains to things that you want to do. We have to actually ask ourselves, is this activity age appropriate? Does it enrich my child's life? Is it a social activity? Other things that we have to take into account is the mental and physical health of the youth. Behavior capacities. In other words, can my child really handle this? Is this activity going to trigger some type of negative behavior? We also have to take in consideration foreseeable risks and what safety factors, factors that are involved. We've got to think about, does this activity involve direct supervision to prevent potential harm to the youth and others in care? At this time, one is going to talk about an example of what this looks like. Thank you, Tony. Having permission to parent also allows you the flexibility to reach out for support from others outside of your immediate circle. Applying the normalcy standard doesn't mean you have to take on responsibilities or liabilities that you can't handle. It gives you the permission to parent your child in care similar to the same way you would parent your birth child. In this example, we have a 15-year-old girl asking permission to play a school sport. She wants to play soccer, but for you or for your child, it could be football, it could be basketball, baseball, cheerleading, or even playing an instrument in the school band. If she tries out and makes the team, what are some of the challenges she would be facing? In this example, she lives with foster parents who do not enjoy sports at all. In fact, they didn't even allow their birth children to play team sports when they were in high school. So they are totally unaware of what's involved in this young lady getting involved in the sport that she wants to play. There will be practices every day after school for three to four months. There will be games one or two nights per week, sometimes home games, sometimes away, which involves travel. There is the responsibility of maintaining her grades. She is currently making B's and C's. Now we have to look at when is she going to have time for homework, when is she going to have time to study, in addition to all of these practices and all of these games. She has a visit with her birth family once a week, and she also has therapy appointments every other week. Now, she already has a lot to consider, and she's got a lot going on. As foster parents who are unfamiliar with all that's involved, and now she's wanting to apply, and you, now that you're wanting to apply this normalcy standard. Let's look at some things that could be done to help our 15-year-old participate in the sport. First, you can talk to the birth parent or the birth family and a social worker to see if they would support our young lady. By getting them involved, they can get um, you can get previous medical history about our young lady to make sure that she's healthy enough to play the sport. We, um, you can get previous activities that she's been involved in to see what level of commitment she made, if she made a level of commitment at all. You, um, she may have been involved with other activities, so we can find out is this something that she really likes or is this something that she wants to just try that's new. Um, they may also be able to help you with transportation to and from practices and to and from games. So the, foster, the birth family and the social worker would be an asset to you getting help to support your young person. You could also talk to the team coach to discuss how long the practices will last. So you can make arrangements as the foster parent to get her there and back on time as well as be able to manage your other personal responsibilities. She may not be the only child in the home, plus you have other things that you um, are responsible for doing. You could also check with the therapist to see if they can move her appointment to a day that she doesn't have practice, which could possibly be on a Saturday. A lot of therapists are very flexible and, and would be willing to work with you to support this young person in this activity. You could also talk to some friends. You could talk to family members. You can even ask the coach for referrals, names of families that are already involved in the activity. From them, you could get more details 
of how things really flow. You could even possibly carpool to practices and games. You could help develop and nurture new relationships um, with other youth. You can talk to the coach about the cost of the equipment so that you would be fully prepared. So when you look at all these things, they allow you to support the young person without having to parent alone. You gain supports to help support her, and she gets to participate in the activity of her choice. So it's the way I look at it, this is a win-win situation. Great. Thank you very much. Before I go on back to our presenter, Marcella, in a moment here, I wanted to address some questions. It looks like we got clarification on one asked earlier. Essentially, the question was not in regards to um, how old you had to be in order to, as a foster child, to uh, be a babysitter, but it's stating that their foster kids are small is the age requirement for them to be watched by someone else who is 18 or is it younger? Is it, Aaron, do you know the answer to that? Is it? I do not right offhand. There are other questions regarding, let's see, if the child is 18 years of age or older, what lead weights do they have? I'm not sure if you can clarify a little bit more. It's uh, Dorinda Montgomery that was asking that question. Another question regarding minimum age kind of requirements. What age can they stay at home if a parent goes out to a grocery shopping or some short errands? Aaron's going to speak to that. Thank you. So in your activities guide, um, for leaving the child home alone, that issue of being left alone in any situation needs to be discussed and agreed upon during the CFT. OK, I'm going to move on to Marcella that's going to go over what this means for youth in care and what role they play in making sure the law is applied. OK, thank you, Rick. So youth in foster care, what, is this, what does this mean for your life specifically and in your lives? Um, I know sometimes we're, we learn new things, um, such as the normalcy webinar, and it could be anything um, other than that. And you're trying to figure out, how does this apply to me? So youth in foster care, it means respect. Um, being in foster care is just a legal status. It's not your personality trait. Just like um, when you turn 18, you can be a voter. That's not your personality. It's just a legal status. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that. Um, there's also empowerment, um, transition plans for older youth in care. And I know Aaron just mentioned um, the C a CFT. Um, so um, and this may be in your CFT where you talk about your transitional plan. Um, but it's important to, to, to be engaged in your transitional plan and talk about these different things, the different things that you may want to be involved in um, as a young person based on the, the ramifications of the Normalcy Act. And then normalcy improves the, out, it improves the outcomes for youth. Um, and we just say that because you're able to engage in um, age-appropriate um, activities, so things that you guys are interested in doing now, you're able to um, be in, involved in those things. Um, what can you expect um, as young people uh, in foster care? Um, I think what you can expect from the Normalcy Act is just really being able to live normal lives. I think although you're in foster care, in the foster care system, you're still adolescents. You're still young adults who deserve to be involved in normal age-appropriate activities such as the ones listed on the screen. Um, and that's the school activities, the sports, the 
the clubs, the events, um, and many other things. Um, one of the most important things that in our lives, other than our family, is our friends. And I think the Normalcy Act supports you being able to spend time with your friends and just kind of really grow um, in that. Because if you don't have people who are around you that you're that you're that are your same age, sometimes it's just hard to feel normal. I know for me, when I was in foster care, I grew up pretty quickly I was the adult uh, I was the mom of my sister um, and I wasn't able to be a teenager quote unquote adolescent I wasn't able to do those things so when I got in foster care um, and I did have the opportunities to do that it really supported me in my growth as um, as a young person just period um, and then you know you have hangout time with your friends um, overnight stays and outings and all of these things um, Aaron has referenced these things in your handouts and stuff like that. And I'm sure any other questions that you all may have, communication is the key pretty much. If we just stay in communication with one another, we'll be able to um, tackle some of the questions that we all have. Um, and then traveling outside and inside of the state. Um, uh, like I said, that's something that Aaron talked about and you'll be able to look at in your handouts and talk to um, the people that you work with, like your social workers and supervisors, better on that. And then obtaining your driver's license and permit. I know when it was time for me to do that, I went ahead and just got non-owner's insurance and I didn't have to be on my foster mom's insurance and I didn't have to ask anybody for that. I um, went ahead and called progressive and I mean you don't have to call them you can call any insurance and talk to them about non-owners insurance and it was no more than like 20 bucks a month and then I had went and got my driver's license after that so everything was under me um, my my insurance was under me and then when I got a car I had to change it of course from non-owners to um, just regular insurance because I owned a car um, but those are things that you guys can um, also, like, if you have more questions about that, get in contact with me or other people that are here um, presenting and the people that you also work with on a regular basis. And then fewer layers of per permission involved in normal activities. And I really wanted to highlight that because I think it's really frustrating when before we had to ask foster parent, foster parent had to ask social worker, social worker had to ask supervisor, and on and on and on. And sometimes in even after the Normalcy Act, those things may be necessary. It just depends on the situation. Everything is from case to case. So um, you know, be patient with your foster parents. Like um, Tony had mentioned earlier, be patient and just keep a line of open communication. Um, but I think the layers of per the the less layers of permission really. Um, encourage you building a relationship with your foster family um, so they can trust you um, when you do go out and I'll give you guys an example I was talking to one of my young people that I just met and she was telling me that her foster mom won't let her go spend the night with her family and you know I'd explain to her that you know she's probably nervous because she doesn't know her family and she doesn't want her to um, go off and then you know something happens God forbid but something happens and then the, the girl is hurt and then you know there's just a lot going on so what I told her to do is negotiate talk to your foster parents and say hey well you know do you think it would be okay if I can go um, maybe to the park and maybe you can like monitor us at the park and just kind of see how we interact and then maybe the more comfortable you get um, then you'll let me stay the night at your foster parents house I mean at my sister's house so just negotiating and talking to your foster parents and not just giving up when they say no because sometimes they're gonna say no and it just may be based on different things um, like I said earlier your, your grades not, may not be where they are you may have had an out uh, outburst or something may have happened to where they think you know maybe you just need some chill out time you know but don't don't just stop it no um, you can negotiate in a respectful way um, and in a positive way with your foster parents and then just respect if they say no you know you can always come back and try again get yourself together and go out there and work it out um, and then also you don't have to wait so long for an answer and become discouraged because like I said all those layers of people that you have to go through can make you feel discouraged but because of this normalcy act now you don't have to wait so long for your answer and become discouraged from maybe going to a, a field, on a field trip or spending the night with friends um, and then also another uh, great thing about the less layers of permission is to be involved like other young people. Um, I think it's really important that you are involved in different activities um, that are age appropriate and are really where your peers are because it's important to um, be involved and be active in that sector as well. 
So how can youth advocate for normalcy? Um, know and understand the prudent parenting standard. Um, some things um, still need a lot of approval, and that's OK, you guys. We're all working together to make this happen for you guys. Just be patient with us. Just be understanding. And don't be afraid to speak out. Don't be afraid to ask again. Just make sure you're being respectful about it. Um, and don't, don't let your frustrations get you into trouble. Just It's OK to ask again. It's OK to have some communication with your foster parents and your social workers about it. If you ask, then you'll know. But if you don't ask, you might get frustrated and it build up, and then you just burst. So just keep uh, communication open. Realize that money for activities may not be available. Um, maybe you can help find or earn the money needed. Um, and that's important. You guys need to know like money doesn't grow on trees. Um, sometimes it may be a no because they don't have the cash. But like I said earlier, negotiate. Like think about some things that you can do to earn money. When I um, when I wanted to get a car and get my non owner's insurance, even though it was twenty five dollars a month, that was still a consistent payment that I was going to have to pay. So I had to get a job so that I can maintain that payment, um, so that I could have my car and keep my car. You know, and I couldn't rely on my foster parent or my social worker. So I could rely on them, but that, that's my responsibility because that's something that I wanted to do. Um, so that's important. Just, just think about that. Just think about different things that you can do to make the things that you want happen. Understand that you have to accept responsibilities and consequences of normal activity. So now if you go hang out with your homies and y'all are cutting up and acting up and y'all get in trouble, you know, you're going to have to deal with the consequences. The Normalcy Act does not hinder you from getting in trouble. If you do something wrong, you're going to get have consequences, you're going to get in trouble. Face the music, get yourself together, and move forward. It's not the end of the world. You can still negotiate for activities once you, you know, you've gotten yourself together and you've communicated with your foster parent, and it'll be all good. To communicate with your caregivers, build a good relationship of trust and really that's just like even talking to them you guys like about school you know about things that you do even if it's with your parents like you should feel comfortable and they should make it comfortable enough to for you to be able to keep an uh, open line of communication about anything so that when it, that day does come where you're like hey it's spring break you know I want to go to the beach with my friends then they'll say yeah you know I, I already know you because you've you've shown yourself to me and I've shown myself to you kind of know how I am you know it's just regular that's the that's the regular life of you know, young person and parent. You know, you want to get to know them and build a relationship of trust, and that's both sides. So that means you trusting them and them trusting you. And then realize it may take time for the normalcy standards to become common practice because you guys were all really just hopping on the wagon. Um, this just came out uh, July 2nd of last year. So just understand, like I said, be patient with us all. We're all trying to get the word out to you guys. And that's why these um, webinars or these town hall meetings are so, so important for you guys to come to so we can just let you guys know what your rights are and things that you can be involved in and just let you know the ramifications of the Normalcy Act. Um, so just be patient with us and understand it's going to take time, but that doesn't mean stop your questions. That means continue your questions. Whatever question you have, come to us. Come to the people you work with, your foster parents, your social workers. Come to us. Ask us questions. We may not have the answer, but I promise you we'll try to get it to you, okay? Just be patient with us and trust us. One question I saw coming up is in regards to shared parenting that I thought would be good for Wanda and Tony. I already see Wanda raising her hand. She might be looking at it. Uh, the question is, I always believe that we should parent the children as our own, but the agency tells children they are in charge of their placement. A lot of children come expecting shopping sprees and over the involvement of biological parent. How do I handle the difference in parenting styles? And this could get at some of the expectations, too, that Marcelo was touching on as well. Well, I think the first thing is shared parenting. The operative word there is shared. Um, youth in care, they should have a voice. They should have the opportunity to voice their choice. But um, like any other young person, it's got to be reasonable. It's got to be fair. It's got to be appropriate. You know, we want birth parents to be involved. But there has to be a balance of power between the birth parents, the foster parents, the social workers, and the youth involved in the case. And so I think it's very important that you use your CFTs to have these type of discussions to find the balance for what works in the home, for what works in your home. What works in my home may not work in your home. And so you've got to find that, that level of balance and create that level of balance for the youth, for the 
birth parents, for the foster parents, and for the social works, everyone that's involved. That is the reason why they're called child and family team meetings. The child has a voice. Parents have a voice. You have a voice. Everyone's voice should come to the table. We should work together and figure out how this works. And if you do it at the CFT, it's a team effort. It's not a power struggle between the birth parents and the foster parents. You, you don't want to have that battle. Use your team as a team of support. Everybody comes together. Everybody puts their opinions on the table and then come together with a plan that's going to be beneficial for everybody. Thank you very much, Wanda. We have about 10 more minutes until our webinar is over. I want to move us along a little bit to have Aaron have the opportunity to share some resources that are available to youth and families around the normalcy law. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to point out first um, that state law and and we're just kind of trying to give you information on what this what the law and what policy as it stands now currently say so these things don't aren't necessarily going to lead to immediate uniformity across the counties we're still working through as Marcella said some of these issues obviously have you if you have questions at, you know ask your workers your workers can contact um, the division to ask for some technical assistance, especially if there are certain things that are either differing from county to county or there may be um, really specific circumstances that, that the guide doesn't address um, in detail. So I just want to point that out. Um, the, as I noted before, the Reasonable and Prudent Parenting Activities Guide is available. It's in your handouts. It's also on, um, there's a web link I posted in the chat earlier where you can find that. Um, it, does, it identifies activities that caregivers have the authority to give permission for the foster youth to participate in. It is not a comprehensive list. Um, it's organized by activity type, and it gives examples when you can give permission um, or when the agency or court approval is required. And we tried to um, note particularly when um, statute, state law might dictate um, any young person's participation in certain activities. There's also, I'll, I'll note, a one-page document in your handouts called the Applying the Reasonable and Prudent Parent Standard, which may be helpful in making decisions related to young person's participation in certain activities. It gives you a list of questions that you can ask um, yourself and, and think through whether the activity is appropriate. Um, and again, you're encouraged to reach out to your worker, your agency, um, your young person's worker if you encounter a situation where you're not sure um, about whether or if you just have general questions about using the, the guide or using the, using the standard to make decisions. So this is an example from the guide, the category of family recreation. I'm not going to read the slide to you because you guys can just look at it for yourselves. Um, and I'll give you a moment to do that. But I just think it's helpful. Um, as an outline um, for those family recreation type activities that caregivers can approve or, or uh, provide permission um, without agency involvement. Just kind of give you a moment to look at that. All right, we'll move on. Okay. Do we have? So next steps. Thank you very much, Aaron. Marcella, I was wondering if you could speak to some of the town hall meetings that are going on right now and in the future, as well as some of the resources available on the SESO website, including the Foster Youth of North Carolina Bill of Rights, the North Carolina Siblings Bill of Rights, and how they would tie to normalcy. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys can give yourself a little star sticker because you're the bomb and you came to this town hall meeting today. Um, and like I said earlier, it's really good to see all the participants that are in here. I think it's really important that we're getting the word out and that um, it was so successful and we had the participants that we had today. So you can put a little star next to your Normalcy Act involvement. Um, it's really important to go to these town hall meetings. Um, this one... Um, I hopefully will not be your last one. I think it's important to go to the future ones because there may be other things that we discuss in that one that may be specific to your situation. I mean, I was thinking when I was looking at some of the questions earlier that um, 
while these things are not perfect right now, we're we're all walking together and learning that what's going to be best for our foster families and um, our foster youth. Um, so we're just kind of all you know working together in that. But as I said, it's important to go to these town hall meetings so that we can really gather up and really learn what this is going to look like for our young people as we roll it out this year and years to come. Um, now the Bill of Rights. Um, I want to just inform all young people that um, you guys have access to Bill of Rights. Now there's a regular Foster Care Bill of Rights. It really talks about the rights of foster youth in um, foster care currently. Um, and those things you guys can look up on our website at saysoinc.org um, and figure out those things. Maybe you guys want to look those up. Maybe you want to see if you're getting all your rights. Um, go ahead and do that. We have that up there. And then we also have the siblings. Um, Bill of Rights, um, where you guys can also look that up and see if you and your siblings are um, being awarded the rights that you guys deserve. Um, I would highly recommend that you guys look that up if you're having any feelings about, um, you know, how you're being treated or maybe if you're not getting rights or whatever. Not to say that you're being treated wrong, but maybe if you just have some questions about that, um, you guys can definitely go up on saysoinc.org. Thank you, John, for posting that. It's in the in the chat section below. Um, you all you all can look that up and and just see your rights. See if you guys are see if you guys are getting your rights and see if there's some things that you may need to advocate for. Um, and then um, next step moving forward, I think the knowledge that you all get here tonight, that I've gotten here tonight, and things that you guys may talk, be talking about amongst yourself, spread that out to other young people um, and other foster families and just be open about that so that we can um, just really have a positive step moving forward in implementing this in our state. Okay, so we only have, unfortunately, about four more minutes. Um, at this point, I will try and address maybe one or two questions that we have still lingering here, and then I will move us on to closing. Do you have? Wanda has a question that she would like to address at this time. I'd like to just kind of address this question that Ms. Juanita has. Does, the, does this act apply to the schools? Some schools are not allowing foster parents of therapeutic foster parents to participate in IEP meetings, stating that the parents has to come even if the child is in DSS custody unless parental rights have been terminated. Um, as a foster parent, you are an important part of the child and family team. Um, you can and have a right to participate in the IEP meetings. You cannot sign documents. They may have to get a surrogate parent to sign documents on behalf of the child because you're considered a paid individual. But you absolutely have the right to be at the CFT, the, um, CFT meetings. You have a right to be at the IEP meetings. You have a right to participate and to voice your opinion because you are a valuable resource to that child. That child lives in your home 24-7 when they're out of in an out-of-home placement. You know as much or more about where the child is, what the child is doing, how things are going in the home that play a valuable role in what's going on in the child's life in school. So um, reach out to, to agencies in your area to get support if you need some support in that area. Um, you can contact me and I can connect you with other people that may be able to help you get the information that you need. But to answer that question, yes, you, it doesn't have anything to do with this law. You have a right to participate in those meetings because you are a valuable part of the child and family team. I'll let you jump. Great. Thank you very much for all the wonderful questions. I want to be respectful of everyone's time and move us along through the closing information. Erin had referenced that certainly agency workers can seek guidance through whether it's the licensing team of the division or the policy team of the division. Uh, they might be able to individually get questions asked there. Of course, we have the uh, contact information for the presenters and I'm sure even Erin might be able to try and assist with any questions you want to email her about. But I think the main focus I'm hearing that this is all relatively new information and there's going to be a lot of lessons learned and perhaps some more guidance coming as uh, more folks work to implement this new legislation. We just wanted to say a special thank you to Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative and the Forsyth County Youth and Transition Community for the funding support to make this possible. 
Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website. Here's the presenter contact information. And it is also, of course, in your handouts that you have. Um, I'm sure they would appreciate thank yous in addition to um, any questions that you might have.